All right, if you're hungry for the word of God, I've got one for you tonight. I believe that the Lord has asked me to address the war between the Holy Spirit and the religious spirit. Some of you have been in this war and been exposed to this war and you didn't even know it. Maybe you didn't have the language for it. Maybe you've encountered opposition and resistance, not just in your mind, but especially in your own family. I'm just going to go right for it from the first minute. Some of your family doesn't like it that you go to a Holy Spirit filled church. What in the world are they doing over there? <laughs> See, because there's something about the arrogance of humanity that we think we need to understand everything and we often criticize what we're afraid of. Woo! Did we turn the AC on tonight? It's the heat is getting turned up. Somebody say crank it up. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And I want to talk about the war between the Holy Spirit and the religious spirit. In order to do that, I need to expose the religious spirit's secret agent. It's called tradition. This one's going to hurt, but I believe I'm carrying a word from the Lord and I want to express this with the love and the heart of God. Amen. Amen. Colossians 2 and verse 8, before you look there, would you just close your eyes with me? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you that scales of religion and dead tradition are going to fall off of many eyes and hearts tonight. Lord, we declare freedom in Jesus' name. We thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we declare liberty in the Holy Ghost tonight. Lord, I thank you that we will not fall for the trap of religion by day and revival by night. We want the outpouring of the Holy Ghost 24-7. We want to live under the open heaven that you have poured out your spirit upon all your sons and daughters Lord I pray for great sensitivity to your spirit tonight Lord I pray that you would expose everything in me and us that is bent on religion and tradition God deliver us in this hour from going through the motions from checking boxes from pretending Lord I'm asking for an outpouring and an awakening not just here in southern Illinois but all across the face of the earth God I thank you that your kingdom is advancing that your glory is spreading somebody help me tonight Lord I thank you that you are above and beyond you wish to do all that is exceeding abundantly far beyond anything we could ever ask or hope or imagine Lord I thank you that there's a stirring in the Holy Spirit God I thank you that you are giving your people permission to burn not just tonight, but every day, tomorrow, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, th every day. Lord, I thank you for your great grace and great power that would accompany the preaching of your word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Colossians 2 and verse 8. Paul writes, see to it that no one takes you captive. Would you say captive? Uh-oh, some of y'all are captives. I'm not talking about the tradition that's out there somewhere. I'm talking about what we carry in our own hearts. I'm talking about the measure of loyalty to tradition that's in this room because of our exposure, because of what we were taught, because of what we heard that was false and from the pit of hell. See to it. Hear the word of God. See to it that no one takes you captive. You can be held captive. Keep reading. That no one take you captive through philosophy or empty deception. According to the... Every time you see the T word, I want you to shout it out. According to the... 
the tradition of men according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. The King James Version says, Beware lest any man spoil you. I want to tell you that tradition, dead religious tradition, spoils what God wants to do in your life. I am tired of seeing people get set on fire for Jesus, only to go around the wet blanket brethren who had... an answer for everything who were critical and dead and dry and whitewashed tombs who wanted to put the fire of God out of your life listen don't hang around the wet blanket brethren be free and be delivered that if they want to live in captivity and bondage if they want to blame everyone else for their religious addiction to tradition you leave them alone but you burn for Jesus you pray in tongues you pray prophesy you lay hands on the sick you cast out devils stop apologizing for the Holy Spirit what is this thing that we do where we go to say the name of Jesus or we go to pray out in a restaurant and we start talking real quiet Jesus name well are you ashamed what if somebody needs to hear you pray What if somebody needs to see a family that's devoted, that takes a a minute to honor God and thank Him for His provision? See, God wants to remove the veil and the scale from our eyes, but I want you to see it just in one verse from the jump. See to it that no one takes you captive through deception, through philosophy, through tradition. Tradition is deadly. Let me lay a framework so we're all on the same page. Deception is the worst form of captivity because you don't even know you've been bound. It's the worst form of captivity. You don't even know you're in shackles. You're boasting of your captivity. Secondly, it's easier to deceive than it is to convince someone they've been deceived. I've preached a few messages on deception and you can always cut the air really with a knife because it gets thick. Why? Because we think everyone else is deceived but God has to reveal the loyalties, the proclivities in us that are bound in deception. It's easier to trick someone than it is to convince people they themselves have been deceived. Next, tradition itself is not inherently bad but it can be the bedrock of deadly deception. Listen, if you eat dinner at home every Friday night and you have a family meal, that's tradition. That's not inherently bad. But beware the things that we do without even thinking about it. Now let me bring it into the context of the church and corporate gatherings. There's a whole lot of things that people believe and say and do that they don't actually have any Bible for, but it's just sort of what we're used to, and that's how you end up going through the motions. Like I like to ask people, if if Jesus is actually alive and risen from the dead, then why do you look dead? Like if the word of God is alive and active, then shouldn't our preaching be alive and active? Let's go to Mark chapter 7. And while you turn there, I just have to share a burden an encounter that I had, something that happened to me this week. I was fortunate enough to go out to Wyoming. Has anybody ever been to Yellowstone? Oh, quite a few people. Awesome. So you've seen Old Faithful then? Does everybody know what Old Faithful is? It's that geyser that explodes, that erupts every 60 to 90 minutes. Well, let me just play the video of what I saw. Let me share with you what the Lord showed me. All right, would you play it one more time? I just want everybody to see. It's just a short video. You're looking at Old Faithful here erupting. Thank you. This is just this past week. 
It was 39 degrees outside. It was sleeting. I don't like the cold. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, was, I was struggling. And I am watching, no disrespect to Old Faithful, but I am watching as over a thousand people. See what you saw in the video. Do we have a picture? What you saw in that video was all these people. Now that's a lot of people. But what you don't know is that on this side of me, there are that many people wrapped around the other side of the geyser. And I'm standing there just trying to have a vacation. But how many of you know God speaks to you even when you're away? And I'm just trying, oh, yeah, old faithful, let's get excited. And I start feeling grieved. I'm like, Lord, right now? Because I'm watching over a thousand people, at least. That's a conservative estimate. I never want to exaggerate. I'm watching at least a thousand people show up, drive to Yellowstone, 2.2 million acres, drive basically out in the middle of nowhere, and we're all watching water come out of the ground in the freezing cold, and people have come from all over the world. There's Asians, there's Indians, there's there's Africans, there's people that definitely don't speak English because I tried to talk to them and they're here in Wyoming and they're watching water come out of the ground and the thought comes to me, oh my God, they are more dedicated to creation than we are to the Creator. I wonder how many thousands of dollars they spent to watch water come up out of a ground and it's freezing. I thought we were going to be the only ones out there. We have lowered the bar in the church of Jesus Christ so incredibly low. Please hear me. Paul told Timothy, retain the standard of sound words that you heard from me. You know what we've done? Lowered the standard. A.W. Tozer said that we can't afford to change our churches so that people can come to church and still go to hell. We cannot afford to lower the bar. But tradition, it has the appearance of being alive, but really it is dead. Tradition is the bedrock through which we give lip service to God, but really our heart is far from the Lord. See, just because you grew up in church doesn't mean you're growing up in Christ. You know, we have a whole generation of people that are addicted to sermons but don't know the Bible. They get discouraged and look up a sermon so that somebody can feed them because they don't know how to feed the Word of God to themselves because they've not been trained. And I like sermons. I'm preaching one. Mark chapter 7, I want to look at the words of Jesus. And remember, every time you see the T word, I want you to shout me down here. Jesus is going to address tradition in the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the scribes, verse 1, gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem. And they had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands that is unwashed. Can I tell you that Pharisees like to get close enough to Jesus to criticize him but not close enough to be transformed? Look at it. They're close. They know what he's doing. They've got questions. But they're not going to get close enough for transformation, just criticism. See, tradition marries you to criticism. That's how you end up with a cold and a calloused heart and you end up declaring that we've got it all right and everybody else has got it all wrong. Listen, can I encourage you? Embrace the kingdom of God wherever you find it. Honor the king and the kingdom as much as you can. Show honor and respect. This isn't a message where we're just going to tear everybody up, but can I tell you, idolatry needs to be exposed. And and I fear that people are more dedicated to tradition than they are Christ Jesus himself. 
So they're close enough to criticize, but not for transformation. Keep reading. Verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they've received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. So from hand washing to dish washing, that's how silly religious tradition gets. Let's just obsess over the minutia of how we wash our hands or how we wash pots or bowls. That's where tradition ends up taking you. There was a a large church near our town and I ended up looking into some of their requirements for their members because what was going on there was very strange. And I read on their website, this is a direct quote, that members are forbidden to merry-go-round at night (laughs) like at what time like the kids are on the merry-go-round at 7.30 oh it's getting dark 7.45, 8 o'clock oh it's about to turn into a sin why? because that's the kind of stuff that we make up in our minds that we obsess over when God is looking at the heart ride the merry-go-round at midnight if you want to just make sure your life is right with Jesus I heard this church built a playground. (laughs) Bless that playground in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit encounters out there. (laughs) I love it. We're, We're getting into it and half of you are laughing and half of you don't find anything funny. It's fantastic. Just tells me I'm obeying the Lord. (laughs) Verse 5. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites. Now, that's not very nice, Jesus. Oh, see, traditional Jesus doesn't want to offend anybody. Uh, Can I ask a question? Is there a traditional and a contemporary Jesus? (laughs) Woo! We're going to have a vote. I'm going to win a popularity contest after this. Oh, what, what is this thing that we do? Well, why, why, do, you, why do you not wash your, your hands? You eat bread with impure hands. And Jesus says, Isaiah was right. You guys are hypocrites. Follow the thought. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Listen, true worship honors God with your lifestyle, not your lips. Anybody can come in and jaw a song and hem and haw, hallelujah. But where is the evidence of transformation in your life? Paul is not preaching perfection to you tonight. I am in process just like you are. But tradition will help you lower the bar and religion will teach you that it's okay to be bound in addiction because you still love Jesus. When if Jesus, the real risen Jesus, sets you free he loves you so much he's not going to leave you where you are see the Jesus I know is really really good at breaking the power of bondage and addiction 
He doesn't just just keep on moving with his religious program. He gets to the heart and the root of the matter to set you and I free. Amen? Amen. If you were bound in addiction in your life of any kind and Jesus set you free, raise your hand. This is the testimony of the power of the gospel of Christ. You preach it. If you raised your hand, you might not have a mic, but do you have a job? Do you have friends? Do you have family? Prophesy and tell them. Testify. Jesus set me free. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. He says their worship is in vain. Why? Because they have reverence for tradition rather than God himself. Religious tradition imposes convictions on others like they are doctrines. A father in the Lord told me once, Get down on your face before the Lord long enough to receive your convictions from him. And then when you've received your convictions, stay on your face long enough so that when you get up, you don't have to impose them upon everybody else. Self-righteous people want to impose their convictions on everybody else. If it's a written word of God issue, then you have precedent. But trying to impose convictions on everybody else, y'all, can I just say it? We have denominations and people that think you're going to hell if you have a beard. Again, how do you get there? Somewhere on the merry-go-round. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the Word of God says that Jesus has a beard, that the oil of unity, Psalm 133, flows down the beard of Aaron. Stop it. And for those of us that can't grow it on top, leave this alone. Come on, Lewis. <laughs> you thought you were going to escape this sermon. <laughs> I, I, I am going to mail you flowers, but they're going to be for Mona. <laughs> Keep reading in verse 8. Jesus says, You teach his doctrines, the precepts of men. Verse 8 Neglecting the commandment of God. You hold to the tradition tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts. Experts, not novices. You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Hold on, this is powerful. They're not... They're not novices, they're experts. Can I tell you that some people are so steeped in religion that they master their form of religious practice? How do you become an expert? Is anybody in here an expert at anything? Raise your hand. You guys just have like a recent sermon on pride and humility? Or... <laughs> no, I'm not an expert. Is anybody in here a firefighter, policeman, paramedic? You would, we would consider you an expert at helping people at saving lives. In other words, you have been trained to help people in crisis. A paramedic, let's say, shows up and they are an expert at helping people that are in crisis. Do you know how you become an expert? You get teaching, you get training, you study, you practice. I'm telling you, the religious spirit trains and teaches and practices and will walk you around the merry-go-round so that you end up giving loyalty to tradition rather than Jesus Christ himself we can hold to our traditions and literally neglect the very commands of God this should put the fear of the Lord in our hearts keep reading verse 10 for Moses said honor your father and your mother and he who speaks evil of a father or mother is to be put to death but you say 
If a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your... One more time. Which you have handed down. Please note that. Handed down. And you do many things such as that. I want you to note the progression. That Jesus says they go from neglecting to setting aside to invalidating. Religious tradition grows from dismissing God to rejecting Him to completely nullifying Him and making it void. Listen, when we... if When we elevate tradition above revelation, we are actually worshiping ourselves. Some of you didn't hear me. When we elevate tradition above revelation, above what is written in the word of God, we're actually worshiping ourselves. We're doing things that God never even asked or required of us. Can I give you a crazy example of how tradition blinds people? I recently read through the New Testament. Does anybody know offhand how many chapters there are in the New Testament? Where are my Bible people at? 260. Some of you are like, 200. <laughs> a lot. 260. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament. And here's what I went through and read. How many chapters in the New Testament do not contain, do not contain a reference to the Holy Spirit prophecy, tongues, dreams, you name it. The activity of the Spirit. I was like, I'm just curious. I'm just going to start reading. Matthew 1, there's a dream. Matthew 2, there's more dreams. There's five dreams surrounding the birth of Jesus. Matthew 3, you will be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, baptized not many days from now. I'm like, okay, Matthew 4. And then I start to read, and in 260, please hear me, 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are only 18 chapters that do not contain a reference to the Holy Ghost in some way. Hold on a minute. If you do the math, somebody break your phone out. You're an accountant, Chad. We we just nominate you. (laughs) Give Give me 18 divided by 260. 7%, just less, 6, 6.9. So less than seven, he, he, he rounded up. Everything you do is up. <laughs> Track with me here now. Less than 7% of the New Testament chapters doesn't contain a reference. And you know what those 18 chapters, a lot of them were? The crucifixion accounts and parables. Like Matthew 13, it's all parables. I was like, okay, here's one. But you could argue it's a parable about the kingdom of God with the Holy Spirit moving all through it. So how in the world do we end up reading the same book and arriving at completely different conclusions. It's that sneaky thing called tradition. How do you read Holy Spirit, dreams, visions, encounters? I don't read anywhere in the book where people encounter God and remain the same, but that's what we're used to in America. Oh, there's a difference between the American gospel and the apostolic gospel of the kingdom. The American gospel is man-centered. The apostolic gospel is God-centered. The American gospel will tickle your ears. The apostolic gospel will convict your heart and bring you to repentance. The American gospel entertains. The apostolic gospel equips you for war. 
We are in a fight. We are in a war. But the wet blanket brethren just wants you to calm down. Like you, you just you just need to calm. Some of you are like calm down. We had some friends, they gave their life to the Lord. God was moving powerfully in their life. And all of a sudden, their family member who's a pastor is now upset that they're saved. No, 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 you, you didn't hear me. Oh, what in the world happened? So they were living like hellions in the world. And all of a sudden, they get saved. And their family member who's a pastor... Wants to have a meeting and talk to them because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they were praying in tongues and prophesying and dreaming and experiencing the activity of the Holy Ghost. And they said to their family member, You didn't ever confront us when we were going to parties and driving home drunk. But now you want to have family meetings because we're in church every time the doors open. Because we're leading our friends to Jesus. Because we're, what? Because the fire, they want to put out your fire. Just calm down and take it easy. You can be passionate about sports. You can be in the idolatry of entertainment. But oh, just don't get excited about Jesus. I remember when we planted our father's house and they were like, you're never going to grow a church that has two hour services. And we were like, how about three? How about four? How about we let the presence of God and the the Spirit of God loose and we don't restrict Him and quench Him or grieve Him. And I just wonder what God can do. Good evening, everyone. I want to dissect this just a little further. I want to tell you what the religious spirit is built upon. I'm going to give you seven things here. In other words, where these seven things exist, the religious spirit will flourish. The religious spirit puts out the fire of the Holy Spirit. I told you there's a war between the Holy Spirit and the religious spirit. So I want to expose the religious spirit. Number one, the religious spirit is built upon hypocrisy. When confession and conviction are incongruent, hypocrisy is present. We are pretending when confession and conviction do not line up. It is okay, it is actually loving to confront someone and say the evidence, the lifestyle, the choices that you make suggest that you've not been born again. That's not hateful, that's not bigotry, that's love. That's so you don't show up at their funeral and cringe because you know they went to hell. Meanwhile, the puppet who's pastoring the service probably tells everybody they're going to heaven. I remember when a a classmate died a tragic death, didn't have a lick of the gospel in his life, and we go into this church, and it's a very religious establishment, and I am seated with my classmates, and there's at least 60 to 70 of us, and basically all of them are lost, and I'm praying that they would hear the gospel. And what do they hear from the priest? Oh, he's in heaven, and everybody's going going to heaven and I wanted to start bawling because we think that our robes and our candles and our incense and our dedication to tradition saves because we are deceived hypocrisy always flourishes around the religious spirit Religious people do not want you to make a big deal out of sin because they are in sin. Right. 
Number two, this should be obvious, unbiblical tradition. The religious spirit is built upon, it flourishes under unbiblical tradition. This is inherited behavior and belief that we cannot explain or defend. This is the essence of going through the motions. Y'all, who taught you what church is supposed to be? Whoever said that church was supposed to be three cute songs and a little pep talk and a pep rally? Where did we ever get this idea that actually feeds consumerism rather than conviction? Number three, the religious spirit is built upon the fear of man. A lot of fear of man. Try harder, do better. It's never enough to please God. It's built on appearances, performance, doing things to be noticed by others. This is the essence of the religious spirit. We want to look good. We want, oh, the camera's out. Uh, I, was, I was totally, uh, or, or I, I want people to know how much I gave or how generous I am or, you know, starting another three-day fast. Jesus addressed that stuff. He told us to fast in secret, to give in secret, to serve in secret. Your heavenly Father will reward you. But when you're religious, you want everybody to notice because it's about the fear of man. Look at how spiritual I am. Number four, the religious spirit is built upon dishonor. It's a lot of dishonor, a lot of competition. For God himself, there's dishonor because we've abandoned his ways to practice our own idolatry. There's dishonor for others. In the religious spirit and religious mindsets and contexts, there is a massive amount of comparison and jealousy. There is all kinds of competition going on. The religious spirit is highly competitive. It's also very possessive. I said this morning that religion makes leaders possessive of people and people possessive of their leaders. So when God puts a call upon my pastor, you're like Schmeagel from Lord of the Rings, like, my precious. You're actually not entitled to someone's time. Woo! Somebody smile at your neighbor. Because I know you don't want to smile at me. I promise I love you and I love the church of Jesus. But my God, we've got to talk. Number five, the religious spirit is built upon external focus. There's always an emphasis on appearance, on food, on clothing. Anything but the heart. The religious spirit is obsessed with the externals. What you wear, all this stuff, whether or not you have a beard. I still want to know what time you have to get off the merry-go-round before you're in sin. I'm going to go with uh, 666. Whoa, glory. Somebody just got it. Number six. The religious spirit is built upon guilt. When you are under a religious spirit, you feel a massive amount of guilt. There's condemnation everywhere. Listen, condemnation pulls you away from God. Conviction harpoons you and pulls you in closer. 
Conviction is a good thing. We should be grateful for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It actually means that God has not given us over to a depraved mind and let us run free to hell. It's Him beckoning us, calling us, saying, Hey, you can't do that. You, don't, you shouldn't go there. Don't talk to your wife like that. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But can I, some of y'all, some of the wives were like, yeah. <laughs> Saw a few of those head nods. <laughs> Did you hear that, babe? <laughs> There's tons of guilt. Just heaping condemnation. It's never enough. It's a lot of fun to serve the Lord. There's a lot of pleasure, but you know what? When your conscience is not clear, you end up blaming other people. Please hear me. Conviction turns to condemnation when we delay repentance. You come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you know you need to repent and get something right in your life, but you delay and all of a sudden you feel condemned. And then you blame the preacher because they didn't correct you correctly. I was telling a story on Friday night to the leaders that we had somebody that left our church and said, Paul, you are abusive, you are harsh, you are angry, all this stuff, they just let me have it. And then that very same week, I believe it was three days later, a sweet old woman came up to me and she said, I just want you to know that your preaching is like water to my weary soul. And I was like, keep, keep going. <laughs> oh, well, what do you make of that? They're listening to the same thing. Why? But one's conscience is condemning them. The other conviction and transformation is taking place. But tradition will help you resist the Holy Ghost. A lot of guilt, accusation towards yourself and others. Number seven, the religious spirit is built upon control. Quenching, grieving, restricting the Holy Spirit. Opposing spontaneity because of fear. Y'all, if our corporate services happen exactly as we planned every single week, we should question our corporate relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that just be spontaneous for the sake of spontaneity. But control quenches the Holy Spirit. God might want to do something outside of our box and our plan. And it's His prerogative as the King to not let us know until that very moment. I'm always like, God gives me some kind of wild idea and I'm like, oh Lord, we couldn't have figured this out during the week. No, I'm here and I'm in control, am I not? But control restricts the Holy Spirit. God wants this church back. I fear that we've kicked the Holy Ghost out of his own house. Like showing up to your house on your birthday and they're inside singing happy birthday, but you're outside. Well, they're singing to you. It's all about you. Jesus, it's all for you. No, you're at the door. You've been barricaded because we don't like your manifestations. We tend to criticize what we do not understand. Can I help somebody out? Praying in tongues, you won't understand it. And it's the whole point. I mean this in love, but it's like some people, they're just too smart to pray in tongues. Like God's looking for idiots that will babble for His glory. I can't explain it, but I know for a fact... I'm a big idiot, so I can't explain it, but I know for a fact that somehow 
Confusion lifts and clarity comes when I flap my tongue and my mouth in a language I don't understand. When I'm discouraged and I'm down and I'm beaten up, when I start praying in the Holy Ghost, I'm building myself up on my most holy faith. I'm being fortified. The Spirit of God is praying through me. It says that we don't even know how we ought to pray. But religious people are still trying to figure out, are they saying banana backwards? Some of y'all are like, eh, Anna, Anna, Baba, Anna, Anna, Baba. <laughs> my wife told me that I couldn't do comedy because I laugh at my own jokes. That was hilarious. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. I want to give you three things that the religious spirit despises. And then we'll pack these altars and see what God wants to do. The religious spirit despises, number one, the Holy Spirit himself. There is a war between dead religious tradition and liberty in the Holy Ghost. Number one, the Holy Spirit himself. Number two is women. Ain't got thrown out yet. I need to keep plowing. Oh, Lord. Ladies, I'm sorry. Uh, you don't have a role and a part in the kingdom of God because you got the wrong part. Says who? The religious spirit. I'm pretty sure that the resurrected Jesus appeared to the girls and said, Go tell the guys, I'm alive! Come on, stand up, ladies. Get free in the Holy Spirit. Get your voice back. Get your choice back. You are a part of the kingdom of God. We need you to rise up in this hour and rebuke darkness in Jesus' name. Come on. Oh, I felt something break. Woo! And I felt a shift in the Lord right there. Religious spirit hates women. Wants to suppress and control, minimize, condemn. All right, we're going to be having a women's conference. We're going to play a video. <laughs> I actually own a wig. <laughs> but I won't be here. <laughs> we'll let Dawn preach, amen. Come on, girl. Woo! A new day has dawned. Hallelujah. Boy, this is raucous. Y'all want to come back tomorrow night? <laughs> Last thing, third thing, the religious spirit despises is youth. This is like a, a telltale sign. I, I've, I've learned this. People are under a religious spirit when they come up to me and they're like, how, how old are you? I'm like, 30. How old are you, Grandpa? 79? 
I mean, please hear my heart, but what's the right age to serve the Lord? Because the devil's going to tell you when you're young, you're too young. And when you're middle age, you missed it. And when you're old, you're out of the game. No, serve Jesus Christ, whether you're 8 or 88. Get on fire for God and make a difference. Oh, you're too young. Oh, you don't know enough. No, I know Jesus is alive. And there's a whole lot of people that need what God has done in my life. And by the way, I happen to know someone else that was used by God at 30 years old. <laughs> but I read he had hair. It's unfortunate. Jesus, creative miracle right now. Well, I bet we'd have revival if I started growing hair on my head. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Boy, it's good to laugh because I've been through hell lately. There's always a reward for the crushing. It's worth it. Some of y'all need to hang in there and whatever you do, don't quit. You keep preaching, keep leading, keep teaching, keep loving, keep serving. Don't let the enemy or the disappointment of your circumstances take the yes out of your heart. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can text the word NEW LIFE to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.